Yeah, thanks a lot. It is a great honor uh, to be here, to have the occasion to intervene in this uh, workshop. It's also a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge because uh, I think this is the second time that I'm in Tallinn University. The first time was with an equally challenging workshop around Professor Alexi. And this time it feels in a very positive way as going back to the student dates in the, in the sense that uh, the colleagues uh, are overwhelming in terms of the uh, academic standing. It is also challenging, and time runs quickly, I cannot go into detail here, because I think the times are indeed hard. Uh, and the times uh, are indeed hard, not only because of the harshness of the socioeconomic conditions, and I come from one of the ground zeros uh, in that uh, regard, but also because we are a bit lost in terms of what next and in terms of how to get out of here, uh, so to say. And I don't have many answers. I have far too many questions, which is the ones that I would like to discuss now. I will be providing a broad picture. So there is in half an hour, very little time for nuance. That does not mean that there is no nuance in the thinking. It means that in the slides, the nuance has to uh, go over the board, that you have to compress in one minute 20 years of evolution of the case law. You cannot be uh, into great details. You have to offer the map. Uh, but there are lots of uh, details that it would be worth discussing. I have a fake, now we are in the fake, in the fake world. Uh, I don't know where is the, the, yeah, this I control from here, okay. Uh, I'm not used to these uh, PowerPoint things. This is a fake PowerPoint. So you have fake news and this is a fake PowerPoint. I have one premise, one question, one thesis and one caveat. The premise is, and this comes in a way from a principle laid down, I think, it's a very good principle laid down by the German Constitutional Court in the Maastricht and the Lisbon decisions. I'm, I'm not uh, an unqualified fan of the decisions, but I am more a supporter than a critic of the decision, I must say. There are many problematic things because there are long judgments and there are many souls. But on this, I cannot but agree that democracy cannot, and is my uh, interpretation of the principle, it's not the verbatim, Democracy cannot and should not be reduced to the design of institutional structures and decision-making processes. There must be a substantive choice and there must be different possibilities to decide. We must be able to decide on the essential questions that affect the polity. If not, we don't have democracy. We have the form, the empty shell of democracy. But if this is so, the question that we have to ask ourselves is how much room there is for democratic decision-making under the present organization of Europe. Going beyond the German Constitutional Court and not thinking only about whether there is enough of the substance of democracy to say that Germany remains a democratic country, but in general, whether there is room and a space for democracy. My thesis, which is not essentially an optimistic one, is that the scope of democracy has been narrowed down. And in particular, the law and the legal practices of the European Union have become key instruments of the reduction of the range of policies that can be implemented in the exercise of the powers that the states and the European Union, I would say, also have through a not mix of rules and principles. If we could have time, we could go into this. The fragmentation, pulverization, innovation of public power in Europe, which results, uh, quote, just paraphrasing, uh, Fritz Scharf, in a Europe-wide problem-solving gap, fostering of socioeconomic cleavages that render difficult decision-making, if you wish, false cleavages that prevent the real substantive social uh, cleavages coming to the fore, and then we are deciding about things that are not relevant. We are talking about the hair of Trump. We are not talking as about socioeconomic issues, for example, just to give you a very silly example or the circumvention of democratic decision-making. And to substantiate the thesis, I have two and a half parts. The first part concerns, and this is where the little lawyer in me uh, comes very strongly, 
the transformation of the justic on the basis of which the validity of European laws is determined. If I was keen on using the term constitutional law, I would say the justic of constitutional review of European laws. And there are two key principles there, that is sound money, the preservation of capital and the possibility of accumulation of capital. And the second, the single market economy. That refers basically to the triad, private property, entrepreneurial freedom, and distorting competition. This is one part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that we have a proliferation of, of, de of decision-making processes that are alternative to democratic decision-making and that hollow out, take away substance from democracy. And in between, there are things that are problematic from a democratic point of view and that re re result in a substantive bias. And I think, Yoneric, I could not say, like Monty Python, now for something totally different because there is a continuity, very obviously, between the two papers, surprisingly. As you would say, you are shocked. Um, there is the problem of the division of labor between representative decision making at the supranational level. I will go into that. And the second results from the way in which the macroeconomic imbalance in policy, in a way, has been organized. So now, the two and a half thesis. Sound money. My claim is that over time, this has become as one of the key tests of whether laws are fine, are valid uh, in the European Union. And you have major limits to uh, state action that result from the primacy of monetary stability, which boils down to the preservation of cumulated capital and of the possibility of further accumulation of capital. I'm a non-erratic non-Marxist, uh, but I think we have to talk about capital. Uh, you know, John Kenneth Galbraith uh, in the Economics of Innocent Fraud makes it very clear, it's not the markets, my friends, it's capital. Let's talk about the reality. I think John Kenneth Garvath was also non-erratic, non-Marxist. In particular, and I think these are the two key transformations, monetary policy has to have as its goal monetary stability, and this rules out regarding monetary policy as a means to achieve wider socioeconomic goals, which was the post-war democratic constitutional consensus in most of Europe, not in Germany. And indeed, the reverse has to be the case. So, Fiscal, social policy have to be subordinated to monetary stability. The second question is that the stability of the financial system has to be preserved, something that entails state intervention aim at underpinning the value of financial assets if there is a systemic risk, when there is a risk that the market would commit suicide. And this has to do with liquidity, with keeping the transmission belt of monetary policy, I come back briefly to that. Because I think this is, in a way, as equally important as the second pillar. Especially if we consider, and this is what I propose very briefly now, if we consider how we got there. And how we got there, our main focus on most of the histories of European integration is on Maastricht, and is on monetary union. I'm not denying that, I'm saying that is not only Maastricht, the European uh, monetary system, uh, EMS, is key. And having in the audience Professor Moravsik, I can only uh, uh, refer that uh, his narrative makes the uh, European monetary system a key part. My interpretation perhaps is slightly different and then I will be trash in the, in the comments, but is this one. On the face of it, the European monetary system is only a peg. So the only thing that you are obliged to is to keep the currency within a fluctuation range. But how it worked out and how it interplayed uh, with the socioeconomic structure of Europe and with the transformation that were taking place at this time results in that the burden of adjustment is on the side of the weak soft currency states, not on the strong states. And this means that there is an asymmetry of uh, limiting in terms of the policy range for the weaker states. And the weaker states, what can they do? They can eitherly, either adjust policy, basically monetary policy at this stage, to the monetary policy of the strong currency states, 
but this creates a problem because their monetary policy would not fit necessarily their economic circumstances, their social circumstances, or they can spend limited reserves defending their currency, because if Germany is being pushed upwards, they sell Deutschmarks, which they can print. If Italy is being pushed downwards, they have to uh, spend uh, dollars, hard currency reserves. Or they can request an agreed devaluation. But the pressure, basically, is on the side of the weak states. Second is that the strong states and the strongest state was Germany. And Germany was a country that had an independent central bank that had opted in the 70s very clearly. You, you can say, for example, Jeremy Lehman on his book on the Bundesbank makes the history. It, it was possible to conceive a different evolution of the, of the, of the German fr uh, framework from the early 70s, from the moment in which you have the monetary uh, uh, ter turmoil from the end of the 60s, it's clear that the, the, the decision coagulates in a way. And the Bundesbank, as we know it, emerges. But if you have that, you have a primacy then of the Bundesbank, which means a primacy of monetary stability. The states in copying, in emulating the monetary policy and the arrangements and the relationship between monetary policy in the strong currency states have to do like Italy did. So in 81, you have what is called il divorzio, meaning that the treasury and the central bank agree in exchange of letters. Legally speaking, this is interesting that this is a change of letters. There is no constitutional decision. There is not even an act of parliament. It's only an exchange of letters. The lawyer in me has a problem here. Uh, they decide that they will not monetize the debt anymore. But these, which can be said to be good for fighting inflation, precludes a certain set of policy choices. From the point of view of democracy, the fact that you cannot monetize the debt means that you have less choice in democratic terms. Uh, and the, the person that was monetizing the debt in the 70s was Guido Carli, which I don't think you could characterize either as non-erratic, non-Marxist, or Paolo Buffy in 78. We go back to Paolo Buffy in some minutes. OK, then we have monetary union. From what I have just said, what comes is that monetary union solidifies, consolidates many of the, we could call conventions, if you wish constitutional conventions, if we would use this term that I would try to avoid, consolidates what was in Nuce already in the European monetary system. But it adds. It adds that now this is for good. This is not a provisional kind of uh, arrangement. Uh, meaning that there is no easy exit, relatively ex easy exit, also in economic terms. The UK and Italy was going out in '92, and the, the, the heaven, did, the sky did not fall on the, on the, on the head. Actually, the Italy and the UK were not doing that bad. There was an initial shock, but then in terms of economic performance and competitiveness, it was not bad, the devaluation of '92. Okay. What you have now is the juridification, the formalization of what was implicit uh, on the one hand on the uh, European monetary system, and you know it. The states cannot finance themselves to the central bank, but the Italians had the divorce in 81 out of the European monetary system. You cannot have coerced loans, which, for example, Cavaco Silva was writing, uh, the former president of Portugal, who was also non-erratic, non-marxist, was writing in the 70s on non-coerced uh, sorry, on coerced loans as a means of uh, funding. It, it was part of the weapons, in a way, or the levers that the state had. And there is no mutualization, there's no bailout, all these kind of things. You have an independent central bank, but you have become used, in a way, to the independency of the central bank, because your central bank was the Bundesbank, even if you were not the German state. So in a way, there was a, pro a process of socialization, if you wish, or could, uh, a, a getting into the culture that the central bank is independent because we don't control the central bank, which is the reason that Mitterrand uh, famously or uh, apocryphally had in order to go uh, into monetary union. But there is more, and I will only flag also the little lawyer in me, that the asymmetric relationship between monetary and fiscal policy results in rules being written. And the fact that there are rules is very important. I think there is a question of false friends here because the People doing public finance talk about fiscal rules, but they don't talk about legal rules. So they have exceptions, and they should have exceptions. But a certain understanding of rule comes that is in tension with the understanding we will, say, uh, we will see in, in a minute of 
the four economic freedoms as principles. So there is a tension here, is, there is a dichotomy, it's a kind of a schizophrenia within the uh, European law. And uh, the result uh, is also that the safeguards, the buffers, are written out. So the possibility of lending through the uh, balance of payments uh, facility is not replicated, intentionally so. And you have, we will see it, free movement of capital to third countries because, and Christian was pointing it yesterday, it does not work, but there was the intention that financial markets will also be policing. To do that, you have to have free movement of capital to third countries, which is not part of the logic of the internal market, by the way. The logic of the internal market is free movement within the market, not to third countries. It comes with European Monetary Union. For a period, and we know the story, I don't have to go into detail here, this seems not to be a bad mix, because there is a certain division of labor through what Colin Crouch has called private Keynesianism, in the sense that the contradictions within monetary union are, in a way, uh, avoided by means of the growth of, uh, uh, private, uh, of, of, of private debt. But the growth of, uh, of private debt results on cross-border flows that we were briefly uh, discussing yesterday, uh, but the cross-border flows results on widow uh, debts, debts who do not have a clear guarantor of last resort. Moreover, the accumulation of private debt, and I think I only point to this very briefly, in countries which seem to be uh, fiscally virtuous, like Spain or Ireland, results in a rapid hollowing out of the resilience of the tax systems, because there is a shift in terms of where the tax comes from, because the states the governments find very congenial in terms of their electoral possibilities to tax uh, the activities that are related to the rapid circulation of money on real estate and this kind of stuff, and they lower the taxes that go, uh, for example, for, that come from uh, personal income tax or from state tax. You have a regressive uh, turn in terms of the distribution of the tax that becomes extremely dangerous when the crisis hit. So, for example, Spain is the ultimate case. You have a dramatic drop uh, when the crisis comes in terms of the revenue that you are getting, which is the result of the shift that was facilitated, fostered by the growth of private debt. You try to accommodate uh, to the path of least political resistance in terms of how you collect your money. When the crisis comes, and here the, the, the terrain is moving even more, uh, uh, we are talking about things that are still, uh, th they could be reversed in a way. We don't know, for example, what happens with the fiscal compact. There is the proposal of December of making a directive, which I find, I, I find still, I, I'm still trying to think how the fiscal compact was needed as a treaty, and now it will be implemented as a directive. Anyway, perhaps it's my problem. I, I, uh, but there are five changes that, in a way, consolidate the principle I was referring before, that is sound money. We have more fiscal rules that are intended in order to preserve the uh, liquidity, the, the, the solidity of debt, that debt will be paid of public debt. You have more fiscal rules. So now it's not only the 60% and the 3%. We have a deficit reduction path. We have a debt reduction path that, for example, in the case of Italy, if this is finally applied, this is huge because you have to reduce 5% uh, of the difference between 60 and the debt, so it means huge adjustment yearly, year in, year out. And you have automatic correction mechanisms that are Keynesian automatic stabilizers in the reverse. So if you spend too much, you automatically have to cut, which in a recession is not a very pleasant thing to do because you are taking a pro-cyclical. So if the Keynesian thing is anti-cyclical, the automatic correction uh, mechanisms are pro-cyclical. You have the patriation of fiscal rules, taking the Canadian term of the patriation of the Constitution. You have to write into your Constitution or constitutional norms uh, the principle of budgetary stability, not by chance only the countries that were on the fiscal cliff were the ones who did that. So it was Spain, Italy, and Slovenia. And there is a, what we will call, in quotation marks, constitutional convention on the impossibility of unilateral default of your public debt. If you are in the Eurozone and you want to remain in the Eurozone, you cannot default. Something that was possible uh, in the treaties. Now it's not possible. And I would say the Greece case proves that. Hmm? It's not written 
uh, in, in black and white in a piece of paper, but this is what emerged, in a way, from one of the many sa uh, parts of the Greek uh, saga, in a way. There is also, you go to the famous letters Trichet, uh, Draghi, I think reluctantly, uh, were writing at some point, there is an encouragement to make the payment of, an absolute, of debt an absolute priority. And this is the reason we got it in the Spanish Constitution, Article 136. So any other expenditure has to come after you pay your debt. And you have the principle, Christian has referred to it, of the stability of the financial system. And the stability of the financial system justifies that we have been expending more than 10 years in which capital is not allocated by the market as is required by the treaties, but is allocated directly or indirectly by the European Central Bank. We have that there is a systemic risk institution. The bail-in does not work. And this is what, for example, regarding Monte de Pasqua, Monte de Pasqua has been discussed. The only capital that has really been burned out out of the crisis was during the Cypriot crisis. And if in an aside that is clearly non-academic, I am allowed for a second, it happened to be Russian capital. <coughs> Irrelevant. Um, so is this, if you want, the, is Article 27.5C of the uh, single resolution mechanism, if there is this systemic risk. We have also, I, I was forgetting, uh, Christian was also referring to the, our, uh, we have a common favorite uh, paragraph, this paragraph 111. The uh, powers of the European Central Bank have to be interpreted theologically, and there must be wide discretion, discretion in the exercise of these powers. This is extremely problematic from a constitutional perspective because, again, quoting the German Constitutional Court, the legitimacy of the Central Bank is an exception to the principle of democratic legitimacy. If you have an exception to the principle of democratic legitimacy, the powers conferred under the exception should be interpreted restrictively, not teleologically, and not by discretion. So I'm puzzled by paragraph 111. Uh, I'm equally puzzled by the fact that the German Constitutional Court was saying in the Maastricht ruling that it has been scientifically proven that uh, uh, independent central bank is better. You could argue that the independent central bank is better. I think scientifically proven is clearly too much. Uh, I would not say that it has been scientifically proven that it's worse, but I would not say that it has been proven that it's better. And I think now the discussion on the independence of central banks unavoidably is open because the central bank de facto is not independent. But, but we could go back into that. The second pillar is the single market economy. And the single market economy is right to private property, entrepreneurial freedom, and distorted uh, competition have become the core of the yardstick that the European Court of Justice applies to the review of the validity of national law. And there are several steps, and I go very quickly because time is running. The first, and if you go to the treaties, the treaties originally, they are interesting because you have the part two, and you have the first, uh, is uh, free movement of goods, the second is agricultural policy, the third is the other freedoms. And it remains the case. So a, a provincial lawyer that, all, I also have a small provincial lawyer, you know, I, La Testa Perduta di Damasceno Monteiro, this kind of uh, uh, gray uh, ch chap that looks very closely to the, to the, to the text, uh, the, the provincial lawyer would say there are different things, free movement of goods, and the other freedoms. It keeps on being on the treaties. And if you read closely, free movement of goods originally was about the elimination of tariffs and the elimination of quantitative restrictions and measures having an equivalent effect. What the provincial lawyer would say, this means that regulatory uh, restrictions are not covered by this. The main intention is not that we have a single set of norms regulating economic activity, but that we eliminate tariffs and we eliminate quantitative restrictions. We make the borders permeable, but we do not eliminate the borders because the borders are necessary for socioeconomic policy autonomy. If you want to have different policies, you need the borders. But there comes Cassie de Dijon, uh, Cassine de Dijon, there is this debate whether this is Dassonville, I would say, and we can go into that, it's not Dassonville, it's Cassie de Dijon, uh, that changes the game, because now it's obstacles. So really we go to full-fledged 
free movement of goods. The second step is when the free movement of goods understanding is extended to the third part, that is to the other economic freedoms. And the court of justice constructs a single understanding of economic freedoms, despite the fact that in the treaties they are in different parts. And despite the fact that in the treaties you see that there is a movement towards a calendar to be free movement of goods, but there were many restrictions. There was a clear understanding that there was a need of positive regulation in order to have the other freedoms, very especially free movement of goods, uh, free movement of capital. But there is a change. The change is crystallizes after the single European Act, but the elements are coming before. And I think the critical element is Luisian Carbone and Cowan, the rulings of the European Court of Justice, because the European stops being the worker, that is the cross-border worker, and becomes the passive recipient of services, the tourist. Or, with uh, time passing, becomes the entrepreneur. So the European is no longer the Italian going to work to, in Volkswagen. The European, the dramatis persona of the, Euro of, of the European play, is extended to the tourist and the entrepreneur. And this implies a shift in the agenda uh, of the discussion, because the issues and the concerns are very different in one case on the other. A following step in legal terms, I think, very clearly, is when free movement of capital becomes a kind of uber freedom. So you have Article 295, now 345. What is said on the treaties does not affect the regime of, of property in the states. The Court of Justice says, Golden Shares ruling Portugal uh, Commission versus Portugal, that it does. So free movement of capital prevails uh, regarding Article uh, 345 before 295, which means empowering even more uh, the, the bite, in a way, of free movement of capital. And I cannot stop. I, I learned uh, of that from Harm Scheppel, uh, which is a very dear colleague. Uh, there is this recent opinion of the Advocate General Vatele on the uh, Achmea case, that is on the bits, which is a kind of very esoteric question, but it's a central question, is about what happens uh, in the Cypriot cases. It was one of the things that is involved there on the arbitration that they go because they have been expropriated. And what the Advocate General defends is that the protection of uh, private property prevails even on the singleness of the single market. And this is the Advocate General, it's not the court. I'm not saying that the court has endorsed that. We still have to, I don't think uh, this has been decided. But it's remarkable. Because if there was something that should be core, was this idea that we were creating a single market. But it seems that the protection of private property comes even first. Hmm? Hopefully, the court uh, would decide differently, not only because of my sympathies in the case, but I think also for the coherence of the jurisprudence. If not, we will have a very entertaining time as lawyers, I think. What is in between the two are the substantive bias that result from the interplay of procedure and substance. And I think there are two, and they are key. One is the division of labor and decision-making processes. And I think Weiler made an extremely uh, solid argument regarding the consequences uh, that result from moving from unanimity to qualified majority voting. But there is an additional thing uh, that I would like to add. That is that the move is a move that does not result in moving to qualified majority voting period. You have issues that remain under unanimity and issues that are under qualified majority voting. What is interesting is the division of labor between the two. And the division of labor is interesting for two reasons at least. The first one is that Again, I'm simplifying a lot, but market making is qualified majority uh, uh, vote. Market correcting is unanimity. So it's much more difficult to do market correcting than market uh, uh, making because it's more difficult to have unanimity in the council than to have qualified majority voting. Second, and in the long run even more problematic, is that this fragments the way we see issues. And I think this is something that corresponds to what Jonerik was saying. My favorite example, I repeat it all the time, is that when we were thinking about free movement of capital and tax of mobile capital, we used to think that if we liberalize capital, we had to take immediately uh, decisions in order to avoid tax evasion. When you do it through this division of uh, unanimity and qualified majority voting, what happens 
is that you have liberalization of women of capitals 88, and we are still missing the proper measures to avoid tax evasion. They were taken in 2003. Uh, they were not effective. They have been discussing for a long time. So taxes are evaded. It's not only that taxes are evaded. It's that we start to think issues in a kind of fragmented way because we see them through the lenses of the division of labor that the European law establishes. So it reconfigures how we see the world, in a way, uh, or the social reality. The second, and I think Fritz Scharf has made this argument, I can only repeat it poorly, is that you have uh, the macroeconomic convergence, the, macro, the prevention of macroeconomic imbalances. That's tricky because it's the member states that are responsible, at the same time that we are saying that we have a single market and a single economy. The member states are responsible autonomously for balancing, but they don't have the means in order to do that. They only have two shots, which is labor policy and tax policy. So a country that is experiencing macroeconomic imbalances as the southern periphery was experiencing has only one thing to do, that is an internal devaluation. There is no choice. It seems that you have a choice, but you only have a certain limit amount of things that you can do. So in reality, there is not much of a choice. There is the choice of how far you go, how you exactly distribute the burdens among different categories in your country, but the overall design of the policy is pre-written, in a way, uh, on the script. Final part, non-democratic decision-making. We have negative integration through, through Euro-legalism. So, Subjective rights are granted by European law and they become a battering ram against national laws. So, the European Court of Justice recognizes free movement of capital and Marx and Spencer. Either I litigate or I do not even need to litigate. I threaten that I will move my capital and therefore you have to change your regulation. In the, in the, statically, this looks like mutual recognition. Dynamically, it unleashes competition, and a competition on which who judges uh, who is the, uh, if it was a beauty contest, as Keynes uh, like the example, who judges who is the beauty are key market actors, key multinational companies, let's say uh, in, in very simpli in simplistic terms. Okay, so it also fosters a Euro-legalistic culture. I think Kellerman approves of that. I think the book is very interesting, but it can, there can be a critical reading of what he's saying. We move away from the idea that the administration, the public administration, is guarding that the law is complied to a kind of, in quotation marks, American model of individuals going to court. A clear example of that is on competition law. It's less problematic because it's big corporations that are supposed to involve and this kind of stuff. I think it is problematic still. But in general, it creates a bias in favor of subjective rights and against collective goods and collective rights of which there is no clear actor or even no procedural means in order to go to court through that. Second, very quickly, is what I would call epistocratic decision making. And the obvious example here is the ECB, but you have more after the crisis. You have macroprudential supervision, which is assigned to the systemic risk board, which is the ECB, basically. Microprudential supervision, very problematic. Among other things, Christian was also saying a problem of knowledge. If you are prosecuting rascals, you should have local knowledge about who the rascals are. I don't think any institution that is so central could have this kind of local knowledge. Let's see what happens. Uh, but the supervisory pillar of the ECB is basically who is in charge of this macroprudential supervision. And you have the emergence of fiscal policy independent fiscal institutions, which now are a network among them, and they have been encouraged uh, to form an network, if I remember correctly, by the five presidents' report. And you have a plan of competitiveness authorities in the five president's report. This means, very obviously, that you have a shift, an intentional shift, explicit shift, from representative to non-representative institution. This carves out the space of democracy. Third is minoritarian decision making. I think we should call a spade a spade. Reverse qualified majority is minority voting. Mm? There is nothing majoritarian about reverse majorities. You know? Uh, a minority of member states, or even one member state, can decide for the whole of the European Union. It's not new to the six uh, PAC and the fiscal compact, because there is a precedent on asymmetric integration. Huh? Uh, if 
you have certain conditions, and then Margaret Thatcher moves to free movement of capital, you have to follow. I think the best recent example is the uh, deposit insurance scheme. If you have free movement of capital, and then one country raises uh, the amount of deposits that guarantees, the other countries have to do the same. If not, capital starts to move out. This is what happened at the beginning of the crisis. It was Ireland that was raising the deposit insurance scheme. Capital was moving out even of Germany, which tells a lot about how much we can trust financial capitals to make a good judgment, because they were moving from Germany to Ireland. Wrong. You should be moving in the opposite direction. But it was forcing Germany to raise, and then they, they forcing to have a common standards, because you know, if not, you have competition. This means that the change of democratic legitimacy is broken, because we have a minority imposing on a, on a majority. We could discuss the details, but I think uh, this is intuitive. And the fourth, and perhaps the most problematic of the fourth, is emergency decision making. And I think it is problematic because, on the one hand, Europe is trapped. We have not only the joint decision trap, we have many traps. It's trap, and the only way of doing something is avoiding the procedural and the substantive limits, which means that you have to go into emergency mode. And I'm not criticizing it now, I'm only describing. Hmm? I think there is a pattern that you can see on the financial, fiscal, financial and fiscal crisis and on the refugee crisis in purely descriptive terms that is moving from procrastination, denying reality basically, so you distort what reality is to justify you don't do anything. The second part is that you do some things that you know they are much less than what they are needing, that is manifestly inadequate what you are doing, and then you jump into emergency. Because at that point, either you act or everything is a disaster. As integration has proceeded, and I think this is the part of the problem, the safeguard clauses that were originally in the treaties were deleted. So the people, the, the founding fathers, if you wish, uh, of the treaties were very concerned, and this reflects on the treaties, about the possibility of crisis. So you have, for example, the old Article 108, especially 108.3, what happens if there is a balance of payment crisis? So there should be collective action. If there is no collective action, then the state can intervene and they can even impose uh, tariffs. You can limit and you can close your market and you can recover from the balance of payments. If you are provided with mutual assistance, you are provided with mutual assistance and you can say, okay, if you really are very strict on the terms that you are imposing, perhaps I just impose the tariffs. So it's a game in which the, the countries are balanced in terms of the weapons that they can use. It's not the Greek scenario in 2010. De facto, the European Union was going into emergency mood. You only have to think about May 2010 Greece, the second reallocation decision, very controversial. I think the judgment of the European Court of Justice is not very convincing. I think the Hungarian and the Czech, uh, was the Czech, uh, the other government, or was the Slovakia? Hungary and Slovakia, I think. Uh, it's, a very un it's, it's a position that is also non-tenable. I'm not saying that they have strong arguments. I think the ruling of the European Court of Justice could have been much better. And now we have emergency norms back again. So, for example, Article 4.4 of the ESM Treaty, normal is unanimity. In situations of emergency, we go to a different rule, which basically means that only Germany has a veto. And I conclude, because time really has run up, and I have already said too many things too quickly, too poorly. What is this telling us? And I think it tells us two things. First, we can discuss the details. I'm very aware that uh, there will be uh, different views. We can discuss the details, but I think there are many things on the table. And on the basis of the volume of things put on the table, I would say, that we have not only changed the content of some norms, we have not only restrained the scope of democracy, we are in the process of shifting from one understanding of the state and of public power to other understanding of the state and public power. If you wish, from a different ethos, and I don't like especially the word, from a different constitutional ethos, from the ethos of the democratic and social Reichstag to what we could say, I have proposed, I, I don't especially like it, I think it's a very ugly term, but it's something that is authoritarian state, authoritarian consolidating state of governance, because it's not law, it's hard governance, in a way, uh, that plays a role here. 
The organizer asks what to do, and I say what to do Spinelli. Like Nino yesterday, I would have to insist nothing of what has been said means that I am in favor of autarky and closing back at home. So invoking Spinelli hope makes this clear. Um, the, 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 I think we have no other possible goal than the democratic and the social Reichstag. It's still in the constitutions. It was not something that was left wing. The welfare state in the UK is a liberal party creation. It's beverage, if, if you want, simplifying a lot. Uh, the Italian Christian democracy or the goal were not against the social and democratic Reichstag. They were in favor. The Ordo Liberals, Robke, was not against the social state. Uh, the alternative, and on this I'm invoking Heller, I think, is, is, is harsh. Is the democratic or social state or dictatorship. Hmm? I think that's the stakes. And perhaps I'm exaggerating. That's how I see it. Return to autarky is precluded, but not only because of functional reasons. I think on this, the Millward thesis still is correct. The rescue of the state is the state that is open and cooperative. It has to be open and cooperative. To realize democracy, you need to think about the European order, not only about the national order. But the status quo is impossible. And I have two final quotations. One is from the improbable source of Altiero Spinelli, explaining, and you can read it in detail, I go into the gist, if we get monetary union too quickly and we don't get it right, it's much worse than not doing it. Because, and you can see Richard Triffin here, this will result in a split in regional terms. It will pose member states against member states. It will destroy the union. 73, in this book that he wrote when he was as a commissioner. Hmm? This, is, this is not uh, the Eurosceptic. If there is a European Federalist, a genuine European Federalist, it's a Spinelli. Hmm? But this is what he's saying. And I conclude with Paolo Baffi. Paolo Baffi was a kind of Italian ordo liberal in a way. Hmm? But Paolo Baffi was against Italy entering the European monetary system in the conditions that it was offered. And he went to the Italian Senate. It's amazing the discussion that they had in the Italian Parliament. Uh, Giorgio Napolitano was against uh, the, for, for solid reasons that he was uh, proposing. La Malfa was discussing, I was making very important arguments. But Buffy made, I think, the key argument. He was not against a common monetary infrastructure. He was not against the idea of the pegging of the currencies. He was against the idea that you could do that without doing at the same time other things, which were the things that were on the table. Symmetry in the functioning of the European monetary system, which was not the case. And if we have to do regional policy, we have to do it seriously. We have to be serious, because if not, and this is the key, there is the whole of a difference between a country that can stand on its own feet and a country that is condemned to being dependent on the others. The idea that we can overcome the crisis by means of a kind of central budget, out of which we will have huge transfers of money, and this has been calculated, something like 8 10% of the GDP being paid now, is not realistic. What is realistic is that we use the European lever in order to recreate the capacity of the member states to stand on their feet. Either we recreate that capacity, or the alternative is explosion, or dependency. But dependency, I'm afraid, leads sooner or later to explosion. Thanks a lot.